the setting was India, although I'd never been to India before. I was in India walking in this rural place and ahead of us was this one level kind of low building made of cinder block with a simple roof. We entered the building and as soon as I entered, I saw this yogi. He had a massive big belly. He was wearing a white loincloth. And the minute I laid eyes on him, it was like everything pronounced, everything collapsed down on seeing him. And I recognized he was the one I'd been searching for my entire life. I knew that he was a form of God. I didn't know how else to put it, but this being was one with God. So I lay down, closed my eyes. I, I only said Om Namah Shivaya once or twice, and then I felt this tap on the top of my head. And I knew with that tap that Nityananda, this, this great being, he tapped the top of my head. He, he hadn't moved a muscle, and then this incredible energy started to pour through that tap into my body and it began swirling violently around every single cell it was just and pulsating the the intensity of the energy was so strong it was as if i could smell burning it was not my subtle body was about to you know, burst into flame welcome to the endless possibilities podcast where the journey of spiritual awakening and energy healing unfolds Hello and welcome to the Endless Possibilities podcast. My name is Garrett and today I am very excited to be introducing my latest guest, Julie Hoyle. Let me give a quick intro into Julie and her work. Julie is an author, artist, educator and transpersonal hypnotherapist. She works globally with leaders in the creative, educational and healthcare fields and works with spiritual teachers who are well known and well established in their field. What drives her success is the result of having had a radical spiritual awakening decades ago. This dismantled every form of conditioning and belief with respect to who she thought she was. To assimilate what was taking place, Julie was guided to write a diary, which later became her first book. An Awakened Life, A Journey of Transformation. Julie was also directed to train in diverse modalities, including Reiki, NLP, transpersonal hypnotherapy, spiritual development and counselling, as well as therapeutic application of arts. These qualifications provided a rich backdrop to what she offers in terms of spiritual and life coaching. Yet the long-term success Julie continues to have comes from the ability to see. Julie is able to see energy patterns, energy distortions, and the places where a client is stuck in all beliefs and habits of self-denial, even the most subtle. From this place of seeing, Julie can point to what needs to be done to dissolve fear and take action. Once these steps are set in motion, Julie is able to help reorientate a client in a more expansive and purposeful direction. And an even more profound and far reaching gift is being able to work with spiritual seekers who have come to the end of the road. At a certain point, the weight of the seeking becomes unbearable. If that is you, if you are done with seeking, Julie can help. Julie can guide you to the end of your search and discover what has always been right there. Julie, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I spent just a little bit of time looking you up. Fascinating story from out-of-body experiences to Shakti Pat from Indian Gurus. Would you like to give us a little introduction into your life before spirituality and what led you to your awakening? Yeah. So <clears throat> for context, I was I was born in the UK in a, in a place called Warsaw near Birmingham, very kind of working class. Uh, my dad was a steel worker. My mother was an, an auxiliary nurse, you know, big family, four brothers and a sister. But from the earliest memory, the earliest thing I can ever remember was having out-of-body experiences, visitations from angelic beings, knowing information about people, 
you know, that I was meeting for the first time and getting these incredible downloads about things and, and not being, sometimes not being um, clear about whether I was awake in a dream or I was, um, you know, in the waking state, but I was dreaming. So there was this kind of mix and merge and it was really challenging. That, and I was the, really the only person I think in my family that had any sort of interest in anything spiritual, spiritually kind of oriented. Though I, you know, I wouldn't have put it in those words when I was a kid. I just kind of assumed that everybody saw the world the way I did. At the same time though, I felt like the weird one, like I was, I didn't fit in. And so I, I clearly remember making an effort to look and sound like everybody else. And I, I always remember my mom saying, oh, you were always bored, you were always bored, but it, it wasn't boredom. It was disinterest in the things of the world and this clear seeing that I'd been here before and I'd done this before. So it's like, here we go again. <laughs> so, so that was kind of the background. So, you know, I was having all these, you know, and as I said, angelic visitations. I had a visitation from my grandfather when I was about eight. I left my body, floated into the, down into the backyard, and there he was with an angel on each side of him. And I started to cry. And he said, oh, don't cry. Be a good girl. You know, take care of your brothers and your sister. I'm just coming to say goodbye. And then he floated, yeah, he floated off with the angels. I came back to my body, woke up, looked at the alarm clock. It was five o'clock in the morning. And then later the next day, I was told that my grandfather died at 5 a.m. that morning. Mm. So those kinds of experiences were kind of normal for me, you know, as a kid. Um, and, and so <clears throat> because I wanted to fit in and I didn't want to be weird and it felt like this phenomenon had some weight, especially when I started to be a teenager and I figured out that not everybody else was seeing and perceiving the same way I was. I remember clearly going to the park one day, looking up at the sky and saying, I can't do this anymore. You have to take everything away. Mm. And then from that point on, you know, all that phenomenon just kind of, it didn't go away entirely, but it diminished. Let, let's put it like that. And so I just kind of went on with a norm, what I call a normal life. Went to college, trained. I always knew I needed to be a teacher. That was the thing I needed to be. And so trained to be a teacher and everything. You know, got married in my 20s. And then my husband and I came to the Bahamas. We were offered teaching jobs in the Bahamas. And we were here for several years and I was still feeling the same disinterest, even though I was surrounded by, you know, incredible beauty, amazing wealth. But I was still feeling like there was just there was there was someone I needed to meet. That was the other part of it. And I'd felt that since I was really young, I was looking for someone. I didn't need to find someone who could prove what I already knew to be true, which was there was more to life than this, you know, the, the appearance of this. That I was clear about, but I knew there was someone that I had to find. And so we'd go to these parties and events, you know, under the palm trees, beautiful, you know, evenings. And I'd be looking into the eyes of whoever I was meeting, you know, hoping that this was the person. And I would just come away really disappointed. So that went on for a while. And then in my early 30s, I started to get a really bad back problem. I ended up, you know, in bed on backrest. And it was, you know, I realized later on I had two bulging discs. That was the kind of the physical issue. But I knew there was a deeper cause to it. And when I was on bed rest, I started having out of body experiences again, visitations. Uh, my grandmother, my Irish grandmother, used to come to me and tell, give me all these messages. And then one of the messages was pray. You have to pray and you have to start connecting in again. So I started to pray. And, you know, these, these, this phenomenon, this psychic phenomenon started to blow up again. There were more visitations. And then <clears throat> I had a friend that I was working with who came to visit to do a bit of massage to try and help 
me with my mobility. And she said, you know, I think when you're feeling better, Julie, you should you should come to the meditation center. There's a meditation group that meets close to where you live and just come try and meditate. And I remember thinking, oh, yes, you know, I've always wanted to learn to meditate. I had this fascination with yoga ever since I was a kid. And uh, I knew I wanted to meditate. So as soon as I started to feel better, and there's a whole kind of miraculous things that happened around my healing. But as soon as I started to feel better, I went to this meditation center and um, the people were very nice. I love the atmosphere. I don't remember much about any of the teachings, but I do remember we were given a mantra and the mantra was Om Namah Shivaya. You know, I know Om is the primordial, primordial sound nama means i bow to and shiva is consciousness so you know you're actually saying you know i bow to the light of my own consciousness so i love the mantra i would happily you know chant it but when it came to meditation i just could not meditate for the life of me and so 20 minutes felt like two hours so i would just open my after i give it a go and then i just couldn't so i'd open my eyes and look around the room and think, oh my God, you know, how does Jeffrey sit so still? And, you know, how is she able to meditate? Like, you know, and it was, was all of that. So I think I went three or four times and then decided that I wasn't going to go back. And I remembered going home that evening thinking, okay, I gave meditation a go, but it, it works for other people. It just doesn't work for me. And so famous last words. But anyway, I went that night, I went to bed and I woke up in a dream. You know, said to myself, oh, this is a dream and I'm dreaming. And I found lucid myself. dream, right? Yes, it was a lucid dream. So I was in, the setting was India, although I'd never been to India before. I was in India, walking in this rural place, walking up a hill with about 15 or 20 other people, one of whom was a woman whose name was Cheryl, who had been, I met her at the meditation center, you know, during the times I'd gone. And we were, I was holding a rolled yoga mat under my arm uh, and walking with Cheryl. And ahead of us was this one level kind of low building made of cinder block with a simple roof. And we walked towards the building and then we entered the building at the back of the room and as soon as I entered, I saw this yogi. He was sitting on a low wooden tucket at the front of the room. He had his eyes closed. He had a massive big belly. He was wearing a white loincloth. And the minute I laid eyes on him, it was like everything pranamed, everything collapsed down on seeing him. And I recognized he was the one I'd been searching for my entire life. And, and I knew that he was a form of God. I didn't know how else to put it, that this being was one with God. So my friend Cheryl said, you know, she whispered, you know, lay your mat out, lie down on the floor and repeat the mantra. So I lay down, closed my eyes. I, I only said Om Namah Shivaya once or twice. And then I felt this tap on the top of my head. And I knew with that tap, that Nityananda, this, this great being, I didn't know his name at the time, but it turned out to be Bhagavan Nityananda of Ganeshpuri. And he tapped the top of my head. He, he hadn't moved a muscle. And then this incredible energy started to pour through that tap into my body. And it began swirling violently around every single cell. It was just and pulsating really strongly. And the more I repeated Om Namah Shivaya, the, the more intense this energy became. And then I started to levitate off the floor and I kept going and going. And this, the, the intensity of the energy was so strong. It was as if I could smell burning. It was like my subtle body was about to you know, burst into flame. And I kept it going for as long as I could. And then at a certain point, I just couldn't hold it anymore. And I came crashing down through it was like I fell through time and space and then I landed through the heart the, there was an opening in the heart and I went through the heart entered the body and then I sat up in bed and went Ugh! 
like this because I hadn't been, I recognized that, that I, I had been in this state where there was no breathing. And my husband woke up and said, what, what happened? Are you okay? What happened? What happened? And I said, I don't know, but my life will never be the same again. Wow. Wow. And Julie, just the mantra, that mantra is connected to that guru, right? That lineage, yes. because I, I don't know if you know, but the, the two, pre and this is, there's no mistakes, right? The two previous interviews that I've done, they were both disciples of Muktananda, who was Nityananda's yes. disciple. Yes. yes. So yes. There's, a, there's a connection here. Yes. Yes. So you see, and I knew none of that at that time, but, but you know, this three o'clock in the morning or something like that, I had so much energy, I could not contain myself. So I get, I get up, you know, I start cleaning and just just doing whatever I could to kind of get, get not disperse or manage the energy. And so, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock came and I, I had to get in the car and go to, to work. I was teaching at a high school and, you know, I get there and just this amazing energy and somebody said to me as soon as she saw me she said hey Julie do you realize there's a sh there's a, a sale going on at a shoe store just in, in Palmdale which was a little area close by she said you should go check it out and I thought you know I don't like those the sh that, those shoes at that place I'm not going mm -hmm. so two other people gave me the same message so I thought, okay, three times the same message. There's a meaning here. I have to check this out. So at lunchtime, I had a bit of space, hopped in the car, drove to this shoe store, had a quick look, went in there, and I was like, oh, this, this is crap. I, you know, there's no way I'm going to buy anything. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to waste this journey. Across the road from this place, the shoe store, was Unity Church, which I used to, I'd, I'd been going to. It was very nice energy there, lovely people. And I thought, I know, they have a bookstore. I'll go in there and see if there's a book. What happened to me last night? Because I had no frame of reference. So I go in there and I'm looking around. And, and I had always been used to buying things intuitively. I don't even, with clothes or with anything, I don't even have to try them on. I haven't, there's a resonance, there's a vibration if it's meant for me and that, that's how I buy. So I'm looking, looking at the books on the shelves and looking for and getting a sense of a resonance. There was nothing. And then I heard this voice, hey, Julie. So I turn around and it's this woman, Cheryl, who had been in my dream the night before. So I said, oh, my God, Cheryl, oh, my God, I can't believe it. You know, um, I had a dream about you last night. So she said, you did? So yeah, I shared it, started to share it with her. And she said, oh, my God, stop. Don't say any more. You know, let's go to a quiet place. Come to my house later and we'll have a conversation. She said, but I just want you to know, she said, I haven't been in this bookstore for four or five years, but I got a message to come here today at this time. And that's why I'm here. So anyway, later that, that afternoon, I went to Cheryl's house. She said to me, there's something I want you to see. So she went and she came back with a book and the book was called Play of Consciousness by Swami Muktananda. And she handed it to me and I opened it up. And on the second or third page, there was a photograph of Bhagavan Nityananda of Ganeshpuri. So I was going, I got, Oh my God, Cheryl! This is the, this is the one who is the, he's the one who gave me Shakti Pat or whatever it was. She told me it was Shakti Pat. By then, I understood. It's him. It's him. And she said, "Oh my God, he's the grandfather of the Siddha Yoga lineage. He's an Avadut. He was born realized." And and I said, "Yes, I've been looking for him my entire life. I've known him from before. I know him. I know him." So anyway, from that moment on, you know, the most incredible things started to happen. It was, I'd have these visitations from great beings. They'd give me initiation. I would, you know, from, from be beings from all traditions, the Buddhist tradition, the Sufi tradition, the Christian tradition. And this went on and on and on. And the, the phenomenon at home was amazing. You know, we'd have light Judy. bulbs. Yeah. Do you feel that maybe in a previous life you were connected to Siddha Yoga? I, to, I would say connected to Bhagavan Nityananda of Ganeshpuri, because later yeah. on, I'm, I'm hopping, I'm jumping ahead in the story, but later on, 
in 2001, my husband and I went to India. We were invited to go on staff at, at the Siddha Yoga Ashram. And I remember stepping out of Mumbai airport and it was like everything in me again, just kind of pranamed. It was like, oh, I'm home. I, I home. just, yeah. I just knew it. I'd been there before. And when I went to Ganeshpuri, which is where Bhagavan Nityananda spent his later life, his years there, I just, I just knew the place. And there were small things that I was doing that I, I recognized were from that tradition, you know? Like I would pick up, I remember picking up my flip-flops, you know, and before you go into a temple, you take your sandals or your shoes off. I was wearing flip-flops. I took them off and then I took my toes and picked the two flip-flops up and put them on the shelf. There was an Indian woman next to me. She did the exact same thing. And I thought, oh, wow, who taught me how? Nobody taught me how to do this, but I'd always known how to do it. And also I was shown how to wear a Punjabi, you know, with the, the pants, with the cotton ties and the like loose shirts. It was very hot when we were there. And I always knew that you had to tie it underneath the navel. Nobody had taught me that, but I was having a conversation with an Indian lady and she was telling me where her head was going. She was telling me how you must yeah. wear, you know. You know, so all of those things were innate to me. And there were many, many things that happened that, you know, I don't have time to detail here, but it was clear that I have had this ongoing relationship with Bhagavan Nichinandra of Ganeshpuri. And so what happened, the way I put it is, through his initiation, he, it's like he gave me the key to his home and every great being that he knew that came to him came to me. I, I mean, I'll give you just one example. I, I woke in a lucid, you know, I was awake in a dream. I was having a lucid dream. Again, I was in India and I was walking up this dusty path. There was nobody around. And then over the brow of a hill, this great being came walking towards me. I didn't recognize him by name. I recognized him by his state and his energy, which was extraordinary. So he walked towards me and I was already pranaming and doing this. And, and he looked at me and with so much love. And he said, I can give initiation, would you like? And I said, yes, please, yes, please. So he took his thumb and he pressed his thumb here on the third eye. And I was filled with the most incredible energy. Again, you know, it's just like reverberating out of me. And then when he was done and I could feel that, you know, I was being pulled back into my body. But before I went, I said, please, thank you so much. Can please tell me your name? And he said, Swami Ram Turth. I'd never heard of him. So when I came back to the body and everything, I went online, looked him up, and there he was, the exact same being. He was a Siddha, he was a mathematician, he was an extraordinary being. And so that happened again and again and again with these great beings where I'd say, you know, tell me your name, what is your name? So Julie, do you think, do you think maybe they, you being part of that lineage in a previous life, you know, and then been born in the Western world, that it's the, those siddhas, it's their mission then to try and find you and get through to you and, and reinitiate you back into it in this life? Yes, I, I, I think that's part and parcel of it, because um, the other thing is that, as I said, you know, I was having these experiences with teachers from other traditions one of whom was Sufi master, Mrs. Irina Tweedy from the Golden Sufis. So she, she would give me teachings. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, I had many dreams with him and he was teaching me methods of meditation. And, and, and what I didn't realize, this went on for years and years and years and years. But, but what I didn't realize at the time was, I think that I was being prepared because now I meet and speak to people from every kind of faith, path and tradition imaginable, yeah. some of whom have no belief system or anything. And so, so there's this kind of shared intimacy because even if I may, you know, I haven't studied Buddhism for extensively, for example, but I think because of the initiation and because of the, that meeting place, 
of oneness or, you know, however you want to put it, this is a commonality. Then I somehow know what language to use to to make it accessible for for whoever I'm working with. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So in terms of awakenings, did did, you know, a series of spiritual awakenings start to take place after the initiations? Oh, yes. I mean, I had it was just ongoing, continually ongoing with in ways that it's it's even hard to describe and define. And in addition to all of that, I was being put through, I would call it sort of shamanic initiations, which were terrifying, you know, facing the fear of death. And I was going through these kind of rituals, which I never heard or read about, you know, in what I'll give you one example where I I would often be prepared, you know, I'd have the head shaved and, you know, my, I'd be clothed in kind of a shroud or something like, or nothing at all. And then in one, I was pinned. I had my arms pinned and my legs pinned. And I was put at the top of this kind of rocky area. And then the crows were just coming in and they were eating, eating and, you know, picking away at the flesh. In another initiation, I was laying in bed and I was I was kind of like in between waking sleeping in the hypnagogic state but fully yeah. aware and then there was these like devilish forms that came around me and they were laughing and they were you know clawing away one said oh I've got the heart he was he pulled the heart out and he was eating the heart and the other was pulling my eyes out and and the thing that I had to do I knew I always had this clear sense that I was, it was a test and I had to pass this test and I would be filled with this terror. And then I, I wouldn't go with the terror. I'd stay really centered in the mantra and I'd hold on to the mantra and just hold on to it like a lifeline. So I could feel the pain as you describe, you know, when you were telling your story in a lucid dream, everything's more vibrant, more full on than in the waking state. So any pain is multiplied. But what I found was when I really focused and went inside myself and held on to the mantra, it was like the pain was further away and it wasn't nearly as searing. So I'd have to really hold on to the mantra and repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And then at a certain point, you know, whatever was so, being done would be, you know, finished. Yeah, so so it seems like the mantra was kind of anchoring you in awareness, and and yeah. awareness is untouched by by anything. By anything, right? yes, yeah. yes, yes. So so that happened again and again and again. There've been you know all kinds of. I mean, because I live in the Bahamas, I guess I, um, a few times, more than a few times, I'd find myself traveling through time and space, and then I'd be pulled down into this vast deep ocean. And I, my heart would start going because I, kn I would know what was coming. You know, sharks would start circling and then they'd start eating the flesh. And I would just have to stay completely centered with the mantra, repeating the mantra to be able to. So I didn't go off with the fear. So that happened again and again to the point where the fear was diminished. And then I was able to sort of just be with what was happening. A very, very similar story to mine. I have to say, I'm, I'm everything you're saying. I'm going, oh my god, that happened to me. The same thing. The fear test, the lucid dreams, the initiation in lucid dreams. I had so many of them. You know, teachers coming yeah. up, touching the third eye, exploding into gold light, a play of consciousness. The book as well. I, I read that, and, and that also came about when I was I was initiated in, very similar with Mother Mira and I had the play of consciousness book in in my hand and Mother Mira came and she gave me the hug and I burst into gold light and then the next day I I, I was reading a play of consciousness and it talks about Muktananda um, receiving darshan or uh, transmission from his guru in a dream right and then the following day traveling to his guru and the guru saying well why are you here? You already received it in the dream. So it was sort of, it was giving me confirmation that, oh, I don't actually need to go to a person. This can come, you know, from them uh, disembodied gurus. It doesn't have to be in the physical. So that seems to yeah. be, and, and I guess part of it is probably you living in the Bahamas. There probably wasn't anyone nearby that could give you Shakti Pat, right? 
Well, the, no, the, I mean, not that I would know of, but the, the meditation group was aligned with the Siddha Yoga, you know, foundation. I hadn't realized any of that when I went the first few times. I was more interested in the people that were there because I didn't want, I know this sounds shallow, but I didn't want to be around a bunch of like gooky, flaky, you know, <laughs> they were professional. I know. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was really what I was more interested in. I, you know, and they were lovely people and, and we could have conversations, but it was really not about what the thing, this thing was about, you know? So, <clears throat> yeah, so, but it's so many, so many amazing things have, have happened and continue to happen that you, you, the mind can never wrap itself around any of this. You could never figure this out at all. Sure. And in terms of the, the awakenings, right, self-realization, like, did that unfold during all of this? Did that shift into, into awareness? Yeah, so so what tended to happen with me would be I was having these direct experiences from when I was a kid, as I shared, and then I had these initiations, which were extraordinary. And I really couldn't talk to many people about what was happening. And I also got this message, it's important not to talk to people about what was happening. Mm, I needed yeah. to contemplate and to and to, and really to trust my own intuitive knowing. That was a big one. It, you know trusting and I always had but that really deepened so I whenever I had a question I'd get the answer I would ask inside myself and the answer would be given it felt like through the form of Bhagavan Nichinanda of Ganeshburi but it might be through Mother Mira I had experiences with, with her as well as Ananda Maima and other great beings okay. so they would yeah. so, so so what happened because I guess I was trying to figure it out figure out really the full extent of what was happening I became a seeker, even though I recognized what it was that seekers are looking for. That had already happened. It, it, I, I got into the whole Similar to me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I became a really ardent seeker. I was doing, I did many Shakti Pratt intensives with a Siddha Yoga organization. I must have done 30 or 40 or something like that. A week long oh. program, a month long program. I went to India. I mean, I was just full on and also full on with the practices. So I would get up at like 4.30 in the morning, chant for an hour and a half, meditate, do Hatha yoga, and then I'd go do my day job. So all of that was happening. And that was really, I was really, really full on. And then I think it was around, two, and also did shadow work, I have to say as well, intense shadow work. But I think it was around 2015 or 16, it just suddenly became absolutely aware of clear that seeking itself was an obstacle. It just became so obvious. And so without even thinking about it, and it wasn't even conscious, but without even thinking about it, I just dropped everything. I stopped meditating, stopped reading books, stopped chanting. I just mm -hmm. left everything alone. And the only thing that I felt drawn to do was to go into the silence as deeply as I could within my own being. And that obviously didn't mean sitting under a tree because I was still working. But, but even when I was teaching, I would be in the silences. It's hard to describe, but I'm sure you get it. And from that silence, speaking would happen. From that silence... I would be doing whatever I was doing. And 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 so I did, you know, that was a kind of, if you can call it a practice, that was a practice. And that yeah. happened for about maybe, I don't know, two years, something like that. And there was also a recognition that it had always been that way. I'd always expressed that way. So that happened. And then <clears throat> I was on, I was on vacation, I wasn't working. And my husband and I at the time were living in Freeport on Grand Bahama, which is another island. And we'd come to Nassau, where I am now, and we'd stay with a friend. And she'd gone off to work. My husband was working on marking papers or doing something. And I had this message, go on Facebook. So I went, went on to Facebook and I saw that Muji, you know, Muji Baba? Yeah. Um, he was he was holding a retreat in Rishikesh and purely because I, I wasn't interested in, you know, I wasn't 
interested in following anybody. Bhagavan Chinanda is my guru, my seed guru. That was enough. Mm. But I was interested in seeing, looking at the retreat because it was in Rishikesh. And I was thinking, oh, maybe they'll show some, you know, landscape where he is and, you know, what Rishikesh looks like. So I go on, I join that there just happened to be uh, a live stream that was going on right at that moment. And I clicked and there he was sitting in the chair and he was looking at everybody. And I had this clear recognition. Oh my God, the place that Muji Baba is looking from is the, is the self. And when he looks at people, he's not thinking, Oh, she's only 50% realized she's what, what's she doing here? Or he's only 20%. He should go home. What a waste of time. He was seeing the one self in all. Mm. And I recognized that the place I was looking from was the same self. So then someone came, came up to him and was asking a question. I can't remember what the question was, but within a split second of that person asking the question, I received the answer inside my being and then Muji Baba spoke the exact words. And I thought, I'm seeing from the same place. I am hearing from the same place. And I recognized that that had always been the case. Then somebody came up and asked another question. And he said, I forget again what the question was, but he said to her, recognition of the self is the self honor that recognition and it was like that sentence just blew everything up because i realized oh my god all these years i've been reading you know books from great beings or i've been listening to their their teachings or i've been in their presence the uh, the place that they are speaking from looking from sharing their wisdom from is the same place that is here Mm -hmm. because the self recognizes itself truth recognizes truth and and that really really put an end to seeking and you know i had a few kind of like big experiences around that but it was really that one sentence that wow changed everything (laughs) and it's so simple and it was always there, right? Yes. Yes, recognition wow. of the self is. And I thought, of course, it's so obvious when it's so obvious. <laughs> you know, when you read, you know, I used to read the words of Hafiz or Rumi and I'd just be like, oh, you know, I was it. I was there. I was it. I was in it. You know, I was it. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, so, so Julie, okay, so you realized the self, right? You, you're, 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 it was always there. The truth was always there, but you were also drawn to the Shakti path side of awakening, right? Which is, which is like Kundalini based and the, the awakening through the body senses. So what, what kind of followed from the Shakti path? Was there a Kundalini awakening? Did the two sort of come together the perception side and the the, the body side at, at one point yeah yeah i mean all, all of that from, from bhagavan nichinanda gave me shakti pat initiation in 1989 <clears throat> and there were all kinds of things happening kriyas i had a lot of kriyas i was sick for long periods of time and then i'd have dreams you know a few times i prepared myself because i thought i was going to die yeah. So it was, there was definitely this movement through the body and clearing out through the body and the emotions and the psyche. So all of that was happening. I mean, I, I remember in, fa- in the fairly early stages, maybe seven or eight years after Shaktipat, I had a lucid dream with these yogis and they were rocking me, rocking my body. They gave me this green liquid to drink and were rocking me, rocking me, rocking me. And then I started vomiting, 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 vomiting. And I knew they were sort of clearing out these these samskaras, you know, these seeds of karma. Yeah. They were clearing all of that out, and and I felt amazing afterwards. And then another another thing that's worth sharing is, <clears throat> I a few times we'd have people visiting the Bahamas who would 
off, be offering things like crystal healing workshops and stuff like that. So I had a friend that said she was bringing a couple over from the UK and they were doing these crystal healings and did I want to go? And I, I had this feeling, no, there's nothing there for me. But because it was my friend, you know, I said, let me support her. So I went and did this training. Yeah. And it, the energy fell off in the training. And I remember that for days, even weeks afterwards, I wasn't, feel, I wasn't feeling well. I'd start to get colds. I, I'd feel like I was coming down with something. And, it, and I had a strange feeling that it linked to this workshop. And what happened in the workshop was there's just a lot of this releasing going on. And I sort of, prepare, I, you know, prepared myself and like, you know, did all the things that I knew to protect my space. But I could feel that things had come to me somehow. So anyway, one day I left work because I was feeling so ill and I went back home and I lay down and I was closing my eyes and my arms like this and I was repeating Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. And then I went off into this kind of state of deep sleep and then I woke up in the dream and I was like looking at my body and then one of the Siddha masters walked into the room and she sat down on the edge of the bed and she started taking a hand and moving a hand across my physical body all the way down. And I knew that she was smoothing out. There were cracks in the subtle body and, and she confirmed it. She drew an egg shape in the air and she said, there are cracks in the subtle body. And she went one, two, three, and then she did this. And she said, it's because of the workshop and and it's also because of the channeling i'd gone to i gone to a group that would do channeling and i went for a few times and i thought this isn't this isn't it this isn't it this isn't going to take me anywhere yeah, yeah. and uh, this isn't to disparage anybody that's interested sure, i get it, it. it you wasn't. just knew right you yeah just i knew. just knew it isn't a, so so anyway i saw that from that point on i became really really clear that there's no more wasting time on anything that doesn't align or have a resonance or feel like I'm being called to do it. And and from that point on, it's, you know, I've never, never gone wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? And Julie, the, the, the cracks, did that allow, because usually like when, when we start feeling that kind of weird feeling, it's like there, there can be attachments or, you know, like entities. Yes. Do, do you feel like maybe with the cracks, it gave them a place to kind of latch on or enter yes. into your subtle body? Yeah. Yes, that's what that's what happens. And in fact, I had a I had a follow up dream, too, where and that re this related to the crystal thingy workshop where I'd been feeling sick and I'd also had pain in my back in the lower uh, on the left. And I had this dream and I saw this big black dark kind of ball of energy that was attached to my back in that area. And I had to really forcefully repeat the mantra and then send this thing off and mm -hmm. pull it away and send it off out into the ethers so that it didn't attach to anybody else. Yeah. Okay. And these okay. things, these things are real, you know, these things happen. Yeah. So, Okay, so leading on, you, you started to develop abilities, right? I, I, I was reading that you can see energies and uh, auras. Yeah. Yes. So do you want to lead us into into what started, how you started to then to work with your clients? and? Yes, yeah, so so all of that really was in place from when I was a young young kid, you know, but I, I didn't have to kind of detail it or define it or talk about it or anything. But certainly after Shakti Pat and after doing the work, shadow work and all of those things, the capacity to be able to know what was happening with people, specifically where they were stuck, became really clear. And, and things started to happen that was just so, here's another, just one example. I was, when I was teaching at a school on Grand Bahama Island, we had a new principal and... <clears throat> He, you know, he came in and the, that morning that we were there, we walked in and I was introduced to him. Here's Mr. Whatever his name was. So I take his hand and we shake hands and I got this immediate download. He doesn't feel like he's up to the job. He's worried about it. He's going to do his best, but he'll be gone within 18 months. So I'm trying to like, oh, <laughs> have a normal conversation while I'm receiving all this information. 
And then, you know, lo and behold, within 18 months, the man clearly wasn't up to the task and he was he was fired. So so that's, you know, this, this information is given, but particularly with people that are seeking or having difficulties in their personal lives, I get this, I get these clear downloads about what the specific issues are. And then I share, I share them. And let me just say, I would never, I would never, never have dreamed of doing any of these things or working with people in that way. But I had a Siddha master who came to me in a lucid dream. I think it was in around 1998, something like that. And she said to me, will you do this work? You will be misunderstood and accused of many things. So I just, said yes I would do it you know because she asked me to that there's no other reason I would never and I wouldn't I wouldn't have shared any of the things that I've shared today because I you know I've always been a contemplative very kind of quiet you know but I was asked to do it so I so I do it she asked me to do the work so I said yes and I didn't have a clue about how to do it I was also I think it was in 2007 I had a lucid dream and a Siddha master appeared in the dream and she said when are you writing the book so I said what am I supposed to write about and she just like looks at me as if you know come on now don't be such a dummy and then she just smiles at me she walks away and then she turns and looks at me over her shoulder and she says it's important to understand your own journey and then she left. So I woke up, you know, from that dream thinking, I'll do it because she asked me to, but I will not write a word if it comes from ego. I'm just not interested. So I just left it alone, yeah. didn't do a thing. And then about three or four weeks later, my husband and I were doing a house sit at this beautiful home overlooking the ocean on Grand Bahama. And I was having coffee, just looking at the trees. And then I started to hear these words and I began writing them down and that was the the book the book was it was like it was just downloaded so that that's how the information is given how it's given beyond that I can't say because it's nothing to do with me <laughs> the small eye it's about hearing hearing the information from that space wow in fascinating fascinating okay and can we can we go into the work that you do now like how you work with people and, and the types of people you work with and what you offer sure yeah so I, I used to work one-to-ones you know with with local people I'll still do that yeah. and run workshops I used to you know meet groups I still do that but I tend to do that more online now and more than anything lately, what I've been doing is working with people who, spiritual seekers who are at the end, they're just tired. They're tired of the seeking game. They want to be done with it. So I, you know, will meet with them usually via Zoom and we'll take a very clear and simple look at what it is they believe, what beliefs are in place that kind of block their own clear seeing and their own self-recognition. It's very simple. But the 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 effects and what happens after is is pretty amazing. Ju Ju Julie, what what are some common blocks that people get around awakening? What like you know because uh, I come across lots of spiritual seekers. Some of them it just you know boom just opens up for them. It's a flow. Others have been seeking for thirty five years, forty years, and they're just stuck. And they come up against like this this brick wall. Usually it's men, intellectual men that 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 run into these blocks. What what have you what have you come across? What have you noticed these blocks? Gosh, there's a whole sort of plethora of them. One of them, it, particularly with people that have been with a guru, there's a yeah. bit belief that it takes lifetimes to recognize the self. There's that. There's also the belief that they have to take on a spiritual name and spiritual persona, which might be outside of their Western mindset and their schedule and their lifestyle and their family you know orientation so that's another big one another one is that the, the guru or the teacher is placed on a pedestal and little poor me I'm so lowly I'll never be able to attain that so so you know with those and those are just a few there's a lot more but 
but, but with those, there's, there's a tendency then to overlook their own clear seeing and their own resonance and their own recognition of truth, which in itself is proof of self-realization or enlightenment or whatever you want to call it. I mean, there's just so many beliefs that can get in the way or, or the idea of next, I need to do another retreat. Oh, well, I had this experience in this retreat, which was really great. I want to get the next one, which might be higher and bigger. And if I don't do I'm it, always, it's always, always in pushing future. it into, into the future, it's, right? It's it's always yeah. in the future. And, and you know, the, the other thing is, is I've spoken at length about this, actually. There's a propensity in the spiritual marketplace for, let's say, inauthentic teachers to sell levels. You know, you've got to do level yeah, one, then you yeah. do level two. And then you, because I've also counseled people that have really spent a lot of money. It's really heartbreaking. They spent thousands upon thousands of dollars or pounds on working with someone who's supposed to be leading them to enlightenment. And really all they're doing is filling their, you know, wallet and people come out of it feeling really disappointed abused and not having really attained anything so there's a lot of that you know I really ca I, I, I caution people to be very careful about who they sign up to work with because I've also worked with people that have been involved in cults that you know been really abused and, and left broken and then distrusting their own intuitive knowing distrusting that it's even possible to attain anything and then uh, you know feeling like they they're, they're stuck and they don't know which way to turn so there's, there's 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 so much to to look at with respect to your own self-recognition but it really does start in the simplest way by trusting your own intuition you know if you hear a message take your umbrella it's going to rain yeah. then listen to it you know if you have a sense, oh, I need to call so-and-so because I think she might not be feeling well, then, then do it because those, those intuitive prompts are God or source or whatever you want to call it and, yeah. and speaking yeah. through you as your, own, as your own knowing and your own awareness. So it's really, yeah. you know, all these things are, are so available to us, but, but they tend to be overlooked in favor of thinking somebody else has a better or bigger or clearer understanding. So yeah, um, I, I totally feel the same that everything, everything, all the answers lie within us. You know, if we, if we come out of our, you know, critical mind, that's, you know, constantly churning thoughts and we drop into the heart and we feel everything you, you mentioned earlier about like how you would shop. It's like, it's like, it's like, you just kind of drawn, it's like not the mind. It's just like, oh, I've been pulled over here. And, and oh, it's like you just know. It's like, oh, yes. this is it. I just take yes. it because it feels right. Whereas yes. other people, they just don't get that. It's just totally alien to them. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, why don't you use your mind to do that? It's like, no, it's, you know, the mind just gets in the way. Yes, yes. Well, I forget who who it was that says the, the mind has been put on a pe pedestal and the heart, you know, resigned to some sort of far off place. And, and that's the truth, especially in the West. The mind is like this pinnacle. You have to have this, you know, brilliant mind. And the truth is yeah. the mind is useful with respect to, you know, making lists or, you know, if you have to study for a test or whatever it is or figuring things out to plan a vacation. But it's not necessary to be able to connect him with, with a much bigger body of wisdom that can give you a clearer direction for your life, especially with big life choices. But it starts with the simplest things. It starts with really listening, even like food choices. What are the best food choices for you, you know? Yeah, it's it's funny because I... I was in San Francisco for, for almost three weeks. And when I got back, I was really struggling with um, jet lag. I had no nothing going over that way. But coming back, I was really hit. And then all of a sudden, yesterday, I just noticed that there's just no hunger whatsoever. The mind didn't come in. I fasted for the whole day. I've been fasting today. But it's just it's coming from just a place of, oh, that's just what I need to do, right? It's somehow it's going to reset my my body clock by not eating. 
uh, but there's nothing, no thinking about it, no planning. It's just, it happens. And I just go with it, go, go with the flow. Yes. Yes. And it, it you know, that, that intuitive wisdom is never wrong. No, but... and it's in everybody. If they just, no. yeah, yeah. If they just trust it and pay attention, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so going back to your 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 work you're doing. So what else? What else is 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 how, you know, how, how you're helping people? Well, you know, I I shared that I was told to write a book. So the first book I wrote, An Awakened Life: A Journey of Transformation, was detailing the awakening process. And then I was told to write books. So I've written books on lucid dreaming and just giving little prompts on how to to be more mindful and aware in the waking state as well as in the dream state, because you cannot wake up in a dream if you're asleep in the waking state, right? So, mm. so anyway, I, I wrote about that. And then I was told to write books on the shadow because, because what I've found is even with the most earnest spiritual seeker, if you haven't dealt with your psychological makeup and your conditioning and your belief systems and all of those things, you'll always revert back to, the mind and to doubt and to distrust and not you know not going where your heart is leading you so I've written books so those they're really practical and they give people pointers you know they can work with them and the thing the thing as well is that what what's happened is many readers got get shakti pat from reading the books especially with the first one I mean I've received so many messages and you know emails from people you say, oh, my God, you know, I started reading it. I couldn't put it down. And then I was crying for three hours because because what happens. And I know this is true with you, obviously, through the work you're doing. When you receive Shakti Pat, especially more than once, and it happens repeatedly and you, you receive it from an authentic guru or great being or tradition, then it's like a contagion. Those people that come around you will get it as well. And I noticed even if I'm not speaking about anything to do with spiritual anything, especially when I was teaching shortly after I got Shakti Pat, students were getting Shakti Pat. I mean, they weren't putting it in their own words, but I could tell, for example, you know, I, when I was teaching here, I was teaching in a government school. It was very rough. I used to work under a tin roof, no materials. You know, uh, would, the school would kind of uh, cater to the local community, which is very poor, very Christian oriented. But I would have these boys coming, usually boys coming into the art room and doing this. And, and I'd say, oh, hi, I can see. No, you, you need to see me. Yes, me soul. My spirit feels good in here. Can I stay in here at lunchtime? Wow. Which I, 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 and the lexicon, you know, their choice of lexicon was always outside of what they would have been hearing in church, assuming they went to church, and mostly they did. I had one boy, I asked him to clean a board for me. The board was on a table. I gave him a wet rag, and he was doing, there was nobody else in the room, and he was going, oh. and then he sort of heard himself, and then he stopped. And I was like, oh, my gosh, because I used to repeat the mantra all day long, every day in there, every day, repeat, repeat really strongly. And then I'd have lucid dreams with Bhagavan Nichinanda where I'd go and I'd open the door to the classroom and he'd be sitting there on the table, his huge form. And so I realized, ah, oh, and, you know, I'm here so that he can give Shakti Pat to the staff and students. And I had so wow. many experiences like that where st and even students that have left you know all these years on will say somebody recently said oh my god it was in your class that I had this experience and I began to see things and hear things you know and she's use, using her own language but it's clear that this is happening so so yeah this the only way I can put it is it's like a contagion <laughs> So, so not necessarily <laughs> spiritual seekers, but people whose lives have probably changed from sitting in your in your company and been in that classroom. So, yes. on on a on a scale, right? It's it's like you don't have to be in a in a white robe and sat in front of a, a whole lot of spiritual seekers. You can actually be making a big change with just regular people who are yes. who are you know in, in your energy. 
Yes, yes. It doesn't, you know, even like going to the food store, you know, the, uh, there's a there's a cashier who's taking my groceries. I'll sometimes get a message and, you know, just say something. Oh, you know, how's it going? Oh, you know, I'm tired. Oh, you know, th but you're not going to be at this job long, right? You've got, there's another plan. God has, and I'll use the language that they understand. You know, Jesus mm -hmm. has a, you know, a, a message for you. And they'll, they'll like, like you know and 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 obviously i only share that if if i'm told it's okay to share and the time is right you know what i mean yeah but those kind of things happen all the time and th that in itself is a, is a real gift being able to meet people where they are instead yes. of like you know talking from you know these stages of enlightenment which a lot of people don't actually get you know if you're just talking to the to the, a, an average person it's like you know what are you talking about so i think it's a real gift to be able to come down to that person's level and and meet them where they are and give them a message that they can they can really take in yes yes because you know that's that's what i do with students anyway you know when i'm teaching teenagers for example and they'll say what color do i do the background or what should i put here i'll say i don't know what what do you think what feels right for you and then they'll go oh yeah, and then the, so again, it's teaching them to listen Reverting to their own back to them. inner yeah. guidance rather than me telling them what to do. Which, you know, even as adults, spiritual seekers can be hardwired into thinking that they need to find a teacher or a guru that will tell them what to do. <laughs> and an authentic See? guru will never do that. They'll always like encourage the sometimes they'll give guidance but usually it's okay figure it out yourself what feels right for you yeah that i mean that's that's the real real sign of, of a true guru who yeah. it'll always revert it back to you you make the decision the power yeah. is, it lies with you not yeah. not outside of you yes in fact that reminds me I, I was i always laugh when i have this memory because when we my husband and i were living on grand bahama we were teaching i was we were both teaching at an international school and I kept getting this feeling it was time to move on and so I was you know writing in my journal and contemplating and then I had a dream of Bhagavan Nityananda and he was just I just woke up in this dream and he's just sitting on this in this window box so I go over to you know I'm from an arming and just and then he lets me sit on his knee and then I put my arms around him and I says I call him Badi Baba Badi Baba should I quit my job and he looks at me with incredible love and he says, I don't know. <laughs> and yeah. he just said, I don't know. And I said, please come on here. Here I am thinking you're omnipresent, omniscient, and you're telling me, I don't know, should I quit my job? And he goes, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, I love it. I love I love that sort of uh, yeah, deflecting, right? It's always deflecting, uh, bringing it back to you. Yes. Um, Yes. Yeah. So uh, can, can we talk a little bit about Nichananda and and maybe if people want to kind of look look this this being up, can you point people to maybe some of his, you know, I think there's a book written about him. Not It's not by him, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yes, there's, there's a few books, actually, and I cannot for the for the life of me remember the names of them, but they're written by devotees. But yeah. what is much, I think, much more beneficial is to find him on YouTube because there's rare footage of Bhagavan Nityananda of Ganeshpuri. It's just extraordinary. He, he, he rarely gave expositions. He didn't, he rarely spoke very much, but people would come to him and sit in his presence and just receive the most amazing awakenings. And his kind of, his one phrase that is fairly well known is the heart is the hub of all sacred places. Go there and roam. But to see to see him to have his darshan is is exquisite. So if anybody is interested, that would be a really good thing to do to go onto YouTube and just find the footage. And Swami Muktananda's book as well, A Play of Consciousness, talks extensively about Nichananda. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yes. Yeah, so that's available, you know, on any online retailers as well. But yeah, just to kind of connect in. And also, you know, another easy thing to do is just repeat the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. I mean, you do have to, I, I didn't understand when I first was given that mantra. It's the mantra of dissolution. So 
if you're going to repeat on the Mashivai, you better be ready for kind of for the fallout, so to speak. But yeah. Krishna Das, you know, Krishna Das has a beautiful yeah. version on, again, you can get it on YouTube. There's lots of different versions of it, but it's incredibly powerful and it does the job. And your books as well. So so what we'll do is we'll link to your website, your YouTube and your Amazon where all your books can be found as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Brilliant. So have you any other mess- final message for, for the listeners? Yeah. I mean, I would say find community. This is what is so great about what you're offering. Find community because that really does help then you don't feel like some weirdo or, you know, you're struggling. You've got a place where you can go and ask questions and get support and also feel seen because that was a a painful part for me was I didn't ever feel that I was seen by anybody. So, yeah, so find community. Do the practices that feel authentic to you. Um, If you cannot sit and meditate for an hour or two hours or three hours, no big deal. Just go about your life repeating the mantra. Right. If you because, you know, I I remember Muktananda actually saying to a a busy mom who had three kids who complained she didn't have time. He said to her, do you cook? She said, yes. He said, do you clean? She said, yes. (laughs) So he said, well, while you're cooking and cleaning, repeat the mantra. That's enough. And so I would say, you know, find the practice or practices that fit your schedule. And if it's none of those, just repeat a mantra or a prayer. And then to and take time, if you feel overwhelmed, just look up at the sky because the feeling of expansion with the sky takes you out of the mind and connects you in with the, with the self. So these are really simple things to do, but they really make a difference. Yeah, beautiful, really well put. Uh, and funny enough, the, the the guy who was on two weeks ago, Swami Brahmananda, he was a disciple of, of Muktananda, and he talked about this, this, you know, period during his sadhana where he just wanted to meditate for hours and hours and hours. And then all of a sudden, Muktananda came along and put him working in the kitchen all day. And that became his spiritual practice. So it's, it is like, you know, you don't have to just sit in meditation. Anything can become a practice. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, a lot of clients used to think, and especially people who read the books, all I do is sit under a palm tree all day and meditate. They didn't. You know, so yeah, really, of course. Yeah. You know, I, I've always worked, always. And and in many ways, I used to sometimes think, oh, it would be so amazing if I could, you know, just take some time off. And But now realize what a blessing it was because I had to take the practices and, and employ those within the structure of my day. And and reap the benefits. It totally grounds you as well. Yes, right? absolutely grounds me, and it makes you realise that it doesn't matter what your situation, you can connect with the self, and you can be guided from within, and you can trust your own seeing and hearing and perceiving. You don't have to rely on anybody else. Yeah, uh, that seems to be the message in this interview, right? This is this is really that the power is within everybody. Mm-hmm. And it can be found by just just, you know, diverting your awareness back inwards and all the answers lie in there. Yes. And it does, you know, it does help if you do have a, a guide or somebody who's, you know, walked the path ahead of you or however you want to put it, you know, that can be helpful, yeah. too. But but, of- you know, don't stay there long, you know, don't be a seeker for 30, 40 years and, you know, putting the guru on the pedestal and feeling like you can never attain where they are. Because it's it's attainable for everybody, right? For this every, is not yes, yes. It's not exclusive. It's inclusive yes. of all of us. We're all consciousness. And yeah. Consciousness wants to awaken through all of us. Exactly. So I think that's so. A, a beautiful message, Julie. You've been an amazing guest. Really, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and sharing your fabulous story with us. So again, I'm going to link to all of Julie's books, her yeah. YouTube channel, her website. You can find all that down below. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you this the... has been awesome. Yeah, really enjoyable. Really enjoyable. Julie, thank you so much. Thank you to all the viewers and listeners. Take care until next time. Goodbye. Bye. This has been the Endless Possibilities Podcast. 
where the journey of spiritual awakening and energy healing unfolds. Garrett is a lifelong seeker of truth, a spiritual teacher and author, and it's his passion to delve into the profound world of consciousness. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten something from it. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, the podcast is available on YouTube and all the major podcasting platforms. Find us on Instagram at the underscore mother underscore force. Take care, and we'll see you soon on the Endless Possibilities podcast.